we will be we will be uh, conducting this meeting uh, as a virtual meeting as a result of the uh, state emergency that has been declared in Minnesota. If people would like to participate in the meeting, they can do so by emailing us at publicinfo at metc.state.mn.us. We encourage people to observe the meeting uh, live as we are uh, broadcasting uh, the meeting live and can do that. And they can also see a recording of the meeting. Uh, so with that, can we get a roll call to make sure we have quorum? Barber. Here. Gonzalez. Johnson. Lee. Lilligren. Here. Muse. Here. Ferguson. Here. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a quorum. Um, so our first uh, item is the agenda. Are there any edits to the agenda? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Can I get a, a motion to approve the minutes for the March 24th, 2021 meeting? Lilligren moves approval. Barber seconds. Moved by Lilligren, seconded by Barber. Is there any changes, comments? All right, seeing none, can we call the roll, please? Barber. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Aye. Muse. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And the motion carries. So we have three business items on the agenda today. Our first business item is business item 2021-84, same week, advancing racial equity in the region. Projects, Marie Henderson. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. I am Marie Henderson, Acting CFO, and I'm here to present business item 2021-84, SW, uh, same week. Management proposed projects to the management committee that would advance equity in the region. This one-time money from the general purpose levy and the proposed general fund reserves will help jump start pilot programs. Project ideas for this funding were presented to the management committee at the February 24th, the March 10th and the March 24th management committee meetings. The following projects were moved forward as an information item at the March 24th meeting. The Equity Advisory Committee was provided the projects for review and input. These six projects include reducing racial disparity through advancing equity in contracting, local housing initiatives account funding to help reduce racial disparities in housing stability and housing affordability, Increased training and hiring for people of color so environmental services workforce is more reflective of the region that we serve. Evaluating of regional transportation to a specific recommendations and legislation for changing transportation funding allocations and planning and programming processes to reduce structural racial inequalities to reduce the barriers to maintenance, technical careers for maintenance and technical training, and lastly, to strengthen Metro Transit marketing activities and approaches to effectively reach the diverse communities we serve. The Thrive lenses that were reviewed include equity, that these projects will be measurable outcomes and investments that help build a more equitable region, stewardship, the use of public financial resources to be used effectively and efficiently across the projects and accountability for the commitment to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of these projects towards achieving shared outcomes of advancing equity in the region. The funding for this, there's a total investment of $5.6 million in these equity projects. This number includes 300,000 for hiring temporary help to help execute these projects in human resources and procurement. And the funding sources are 3.9 from the general purpose levy and proposal of 1.7 from the general fund reserves. 
in the 2021 budget, it does set aside the 3.9 of the general purpose levy for advancing equity in the region projects. The balance of this funding for these projects will come from the proposed general fund reserves and will be presented in a future, future budget amendment. For support and opposition of this business item, there is information that was presented to the Equity Advance Advisory Committee or the EAC. The Advanced Equity and Region Through Contracting Projects, there was concern stated for paying financial incentives to large contractors that exceeds goals with the interest in learning more. Input sought understanding of the DBEs and MCUB program certifications and goals, set, setting to concern to consider broadening the definition of small businesses. Interest was expressed to maybe double down on other council on uh, job training initiatives. For the Environmental Services Youth Job Skill Program received support for hiring more people of color. Interest was expressed in creating opportunities for full-time positions after summer employment with the intention of addressing inner culture and inclusion in the workplace. And expanding multi multicultural marketing and frequency received a request for commitment to work with only BIPOC led marketing and engagement firms and artists. The additional comments supported the focus of equity driven funding. Input emphasized intentional partnership with community or nonprofits that have been established programs and community connections. So, Mr. Chair, the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council approved the advancing equity in the region project. Uh, one for advancing equity in the region through contracting of $600,000. Two for local housing incentive account program for $4 million. Three for environmental services youth job skill program of $100,000. Four for equity evaluation of regional transportation investment of 250,000. Five for maintenance technical training of 200,000, expanding multicultural marketing research and frequency of 150,000, and number seven for temporary help to execute these projects in human resources and procurement for 300,000. Thank you, Marie. Is there any discussion? Councilor Lilligan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Marie, for the report on the work on this. And just a question about the conversation that was had at the Equity Advisory Committee, especially uh, where they raised concerns uh, uh, about incentivizing large contractors. And so I'm, I'm just trying to tell from the report if there was actually opposition to this or was it just something they were interested in learning more about? Yes, Mr. Chair and committee members, I'm gonna call on Cy Jordan. She was present at that meeting and can maybe add more to that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Council members. This is Cy Jordan, Director of Equal Opportunity. And so we actually presented this information in writing to the EAC to review and they submitted comments in writing. So the comment um, specific to offering incentives with contractors was just stated as a concern for giving more money to large contractors versus investment in small businesses. Um, and then it had a statement that followed, but there was an admittance that they didn't know enough about the program and wanted to learn more. And in our proposal with the three combined proposals, we do um, look at providing incentives, which we have the authority to do so. In the past, we traditionally looked at how could we better enforce our contracting goals. In this instance, we're also looking at how can we incentivize contractors in that same proposal in uh, the number three area, we are making a concerted effort to have intentional focus on the small businesses as well. So we have a three pronged approach in this uh, proposal. Great, thanks. I uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Any other discussion on this business item? 
Get a motion to approve business item 2021-84, same week. Lilligren moves approval. Moves a second. All right, any other discussion? All right, can we call the roll, please? Barber. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Luce. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. And the motion carries. The second business item we have is 2021-86, non-representative plan changes. I think it's Marcy Cordes that is going to present for Marcy Simon on this business item. Yes, Mr. Chair, council members, good afternoon. I am filling in for Marcy on this item today. Um, our first item uh, are, yes, recommended changes to uh, the council's uh, non-represented plan. Uh, this plan is brought to uh, management committee on an annual basis. It covers um, our non-represented group, which is approximately 400 employees who are not covered by our uh, bargaining agreements. That includes our confidential clerical, administrative and technical technical staff, as well as our senior managerial and uh, executive classifications across the the changes, recommended changes this year are limited to uh, compensation uh, and reflect uh, the um, uh, uh, bargaining direction uh, that uh, we discussed at a prior meeting that includes a 2% general increase for all employees that are in step movement, steps four through eight of the compensation grid. Um, it also uh, includes a 2% increase for employees that are in the performance range of the compensation grid. It also um, provides for a 1.5% performance pool for that employee group as well. Uh, the rest of the changes um, are really uh, housekeeping to reflect the compensation recommendations. In terms of the Thrive Lens analysis, we use two. Uh, for our compensation uh, plans. One is stewardship. Uh, the plan falls within the financial parameters established by the council for managing labor costs and also prosperity. Uh, uh, we believe the um, proposal presents a fair and reasonable compensation for employees and demonstrates our uh, commitment to investing in our employees. Again, these increases fall within uh, the 2021 adopted budget and are consistent with uh, prior parameters established by this committee. So the proposed action again is that uh, uh, management committee approval of the non-represented plan changes effective December 26, 2020. Questions? Are there any questions on this business item? Yeah, Mr. Chair. This is Robert, Councilmember Lilligran. Thanks, Marcy, for the report and for the work on this. And I just have a question about timing, only because it's something I overheard out in the community about, is this later than we usually approve this, or is this the usual uh, timing for the approval of the non-representative uh, group? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Lilligren, uh, this timing is later. Normally, we would uh, bring the um, non-represented plan uh, to uh, this group in uh, late fall, early winter. Okay. Um, uh, it, it really has just been part and parcel of all of the challenges that we've had establishing um, economic and compensation pol policies during the pandemic and during this round of bargaining as well. Okay. So we certainly hope to be able to bring the next one back, I think in early December. Great, thanks Marcy, thanks Mr. Chair. Thank you, any other questions? All right, seeing none, can I get a motion to approve business item 2021-86? Moved by Barber. Is there a second? Second by, second by Lilligren. Oh. Moved by Barber, seconded by Lee. Is there any other discussion? Can we call the roll? Barber. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Muse. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you.
and the motion carries. So this third business item we have is 2021-93, labor agreement with the Law Enforcement Labor Services Local 432 for the full-time police officer. Marcy, you're up again. Yes, thanks very much, Mr. Chair and uh, council members. Um, on uh, March 25th, uh, Law Enforcement Labor Services Local 432 ratified a tentative agreement with the council. Um, the uh, bargaining unit covers our full-time police officers, about 100 individuals. Uh, the elements of the agreement uh, are primarily focused on economics. The duration of the agreement is effective January 1 of 2021 and expires December 31st of 2023. Uh, the wage increases that we've agreed to are a 2% general increase for all members of the bargaining unit in year one, a 2% increase in year two, and a 2.5% increase in year three. Um, there are no other major economic changes to the contract. There were a few clarifications around eligibility uh, for certain premium pays and some revisions to uh, the grievance process. The um, Thrive Lens analysis that we apply uh, to the labor agreements are the same. First, stewardship, falling within uh, the financial parameters established by the council and exhibiting a Effective management of public resources and again, prosperity, what we think is a very fair and reasonable settlement uh, and reflects our uh, commitment to investing in our employees. And again, this uh, parameter, uh, uh, these wage increases uh, reflect the authority established by this committee last month. So our proposal is uh, uh, approval of uh, uh, authorize, authorizing the regional administrator to enter into an agreement with uh, Law Enforcement Labor Services Local 432, effective for the period January 1, 2021 through December 31, 2023. And uh, take any questions regarding this settlement. Thank you. Are, th are there any questions? No, seeing none, is there a motion to approve business item 2021-93? Moved by Barbara. Is there a second? Second by Lee. Seconded by council member Lee. So business item 2021-93 moved by Barbara, seconded by Lee. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, can we call the roll? Barber. Aye. Lee. Aye. Lilligren. Aye. Luce. Aye. Ferguson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, so we'll move on to our information items. We just we have one uh, good piece of news for everybody that I'd have maybe Mark Thompson just share the an update from our recent bond sale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, committee members. We got Mark Thompson, I'm Senior Manager of Treasury. And yeah, I'd be happy to give you a quick update on our bond sale yesterday. Uh, we, if you remember, we brought um, grant anticipation notes for the Southwest Light Rail project, and we brought those to market yesterday. And we had fantastic results. Um, and before I tell you those, I I would like to to make sure everybody knows that we were reaffirmed with AAA ratings again from both Moody's and Sanders and Poor's. So that was great. And um, so we brought two different series of grant anticipation notes to market yesterday, and we had really good participation. We had seven bidders on both these both of the bonds. Um, J.P. Morgan ended up buying both, and this, if you remember, it's a second in a series of four GANs. This was the big one. Um, we we're looking for $435 million of proceeds. So this was the biggest piece. So um, we had fabulous results. We, we, the shorter series, which was had maturities from one to four years, um, came at an interest rate of 0.259%. So about a quarter of 1%. 
um, that was beat beat our financial advisors' expectations. It's well within the financial parameters of our resolution, and um, was well below the the projections that the project has. A, they use projections at two percent. So this is really good news for the project budget. Um, the second series was a little bit longer series that was had maturities from five to eight years, and that came at a interest rate of 0.732. So again, about less, quite a bit less than 1%, 0.732. Um, that was, again, below our financial advisors' expectations. They were looking for a 0.8 or so. Um, and this one's also well below the projections of the project budget. So. So it's a great, great result for the project. Um, our, you know, if you look at what the project was was projecting for interest costs on the bands that we've issued to date, this would, including the one we did in December and the two yesterday, um, our financing costs are about thirty five million dollars less than we projected. So, the interest rates are are um, fabulous. So, that's those will close in early May. We'll get the proceeds. And then also, as a reminder, we've got another bond sale next week. We're bringing some park bonds to market and. Uh, so we're refinancing some wastewater bonds, so that'll be hope for more good results on um, next week. Also. Any questions I'd be happy to answer. Mark, how do the uh, premiums work? Well, we did get. So the bids that came in yesterday did have a large premiums on them. They put. Put large coupons on it, which resulted in a large, large premium. So we took the premium and we reduced the issuance size, um, which resulted in less par value and also helps helps reduce uh, the principal payments that we'll have to make in the future. So that's how we how we use that premium amount. It was a pretty large amount. It was about seventy million dollars of premium between the two. So that's large. We've reduced our borrowing by that. Perfect. Any any other questions for Mark? That's great news. The project could use the thirty five million dollars for some of the other things that need to happen. So, yep. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark. So our first uh, information item that we have on the agenda is a COVID update. Phil Wall Jasper who is our acting regional administrator and leads our incident command, I believe, as well as his other title. So. That is correct, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, committee members. Good afternoon. As mentioned, Phil Wall Jasper, I'm the acting deputy regional administrator, as well as the incident commander for the council's COVID response and happy to provide another update um, on how we're handling COVID. It's been a couple months since I've provided this, and obviously a lot has changed since then. But um, what I'd like to do is just kind of start with an overview of what we have in place to manage this and what the structure has been. So, Greg, if you go to the next slide, please. So, you've seen this before. This is the Council's Incident Command uh, structure, and it's modeled after FEMA's Incident Management, um, Incident Command Management System. And it was put in place at the federal level back after September 11th as a way to really coordinate a response from an organization in the event of some incident or crisis that um, needed coordinated efforts and coordinated response. So this was put into place. This is something that the council has been working on for years actually as a part of our business continuity group, uh, our continuity of operations plan, our COOP. And I give a lot of credit to Kathy Matter and Lisa Bellin for putting this together. Um, and I like to, when I talk about this, I, I talk about the, the the process and what the objective is. And I look at the incident command um, as a team and the incident commander works with the executive policy group, stakeholders and others to really come up with objectives. So the question is, what's the objective of the organization in response to that particular incident? And in this case, it was the pandemic. So as we put together that objective, that objective is communicated to the planning group, which is down in the, in the lower right hand corner of uh, this chart. And the planning group is given the task of putting together a plan to meet those objectives. What's a little unique with the council is that we have the different divisions. So while we have an overriding guidance from the council, 
we recognize that each division might be a little bit different based on the operations. So we have the planning group put together a plan. They take that plan and then give it to the operations group whose job is to put that plan into motion. And along this entire process, all these, uh, these different groups are supported by logistics, finance, communication, all of which um, are very critical to making sure that we have the right system in place, the right plan in place, I should say. And then it's communicated in a way that's effective that we can actually put this into motion throughout the organization. So a lot of great work has been done uh, by this group. A lot of people have been working uh, many, many hours behind the scenes to put this in, into, into place. And I will tell you that I think because of the work that's been done, we've been put in a position as an organization that far exceeds other organizations in terms of um, getting ready to put people into a teleworking position, for example, um, getting people the ability to have, to have testing. And then more importantly, which is what we're dealing with now, is vaccinations. Um, so I'll talk about that in a moment. But Greg, if you can go to the next slide, please. So the incident command, I, I'd like to, to look at the incident command in, in, in terms of phases and how we've responded. Um, so a little over a year ago, about a year ago, we put this into place, um, full, fully implemented the first phase and the first response and the first criteria we had, the first objective was to how do we continue our critical operations, our critical services, and continue to support those services. So that involved, as we've talked about before, a lot of efforts from a technology standpoint, making sure that we have the right um, equipment to, for people that can telework to do so, making sure that we have the facility set up in a way for our on-site essential employees to continue the work that they need to continue, um, to have the right PPE, the, the personal protective equipment in place for those uh, employees. So a lot went into that, and the, the turnaround time with that was, uh, as I've mentioned before, is just amazing, and, and the work that went into that. So then the next objective became, how do we, as an organization, control the spread of this, this virus throughout our workforce? So we started to look at contact tracing and testing. And again, a lot went into the contact tracing. We have a very robust communication system in place where if somebody is exposed to someone who had a positive test or someone themselves, an employee gets uh, a positive result, that there's a process where they know where to go, who to communicate with, and we can get that notice out to those individuals that may be close contacts as quickly as we can, because the intent was that we wanted to control the spread of the, of, of the virus within the organization, which in turn helps control the spread within the community. Um, as you can imagine, one of the biggest challenges with, with those two uh, is that the, the guidance from the CDC and MDH is what we look to, that changes all the time. As we learn more about this pandemic, we've had more changes, we've had more changes to the guidance, which in turn means we have to make more changes to our plans and our operations. So all of it comes back to this, this structure that we had in place that allows us to pivot and I, I, I just have to pause there because I, every time I have COVID meetings, one it's kind of a joke now, I always talk about the ability to pivot, right? We always have to pivot. We have to pivot quickly and we have to pivot effectively. And we're able to do that. And it really puts us in a good position with that fourth bullet point uh, in vaccinations. Um, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then following that longer term, returning to the office for the teleworking staff as one of the last phases that we have. Uh, so before I transition into vaccinations, let me pause there real quick to see if there are any questions about what we've done up to this point. Yes. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just have a question is the like the return to office plan. You, this is probably something you're still working out, but I know a lot of um, private sector businesses are looking at hybrid approaches or different things like that because they have set up their employees to, with the ability to work from home. Are we considering anything like that for some of our workforce or is the intention to bring everybody back into the office? Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I will talk a little bit more about the return to work plan in a couple slides, but to answer that specific question, it it's a phased in approach. We, we do have a plan in place. We're working on a plan, both in terms of the short term, 
to bring people back to work once we get on the on the back side of this pandemic. But then there's also discussion longer term, which gets into our telework policy. But I'll cover that in a couple slides. So for the next slide, Greg, please, I wanted to talk about um, vaccinations. So the objective with this was, was really two things. We wanted to make sure, number one, that our employees um, knew of all the other opportunities and, and, the, and the, the resources that were out there at the state level that may put them in a position to get a vaccination outside of, of the council, outside of work. So we, we're not mandating the, the vaccination, but we're strongly encouraging it. And we continue with the communication to the employees on a regular basis of, there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, we encourage you to go out and look for those, sign up, take advantage of what uh, the really good work that's been done at the state level on the MDH website to get you into that queue to get vaccinated. The second piece of this is that we knew at some point we would have to be, be able to offer vaccines through, through work. And there were a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of work went into figuring out how to best roll that out. And as everyone saw in the state, and everyone knows the the, the prioritization of the the people that could get the vaccinations was clearly, or it was outlined on the state's website, and we were trying to model our prioritization after that. Um, but we thought, in terms of getting vaccines through our own our work, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's first look to see some of these locations that already have a state set site and see if we can partner with them to administer the vaccines that we would get through work at some point at these other um, other sites that were already set up. Because a lot, of, a lot of planning had to go into making sure we had sites with the right equipment and everything set up so that that traffic of, uh, for vaccinations would flow uh, properly. So through that effort, we reached out to a couple different counties and, a couple, and we continue to work with the state and what we quickly realized is that um, while the state did outline the prioritization for the vaccine rollout, we realized that a lot of these entities were farther along in rolling out those vaccines within their own group than other entities. So some counties were farther along than others. And through those, those uh, the, the reaching out and the partnership and the, and the communication that we had, we first looked to try to partner with them to use their sites. But as it turned out, they actually had the availability within their own allotted vaccines to vaccinate our employees that were within, that met the criteria according to the state, because they may have been farther along just in the demographics of their, of their county, for example. So what we were able to do is we started to get these allotments of vaccines, if you will. We used to get you know, 200 here, 600 there, and we would roll them out to our employees um, based on the prioritization that we had built in, which again was based on what we were seeing from the, the at the state level. So a lot of these employees were able to get vaccinated through those opportunities that weren't directly through the council. And I will say, I, I, I should point out, one of the reasons that we were able to do that so effectively and so quickly was because of the work that, again, Kathy Matter and Lisa Bellin had done in putting together a system where we could communicate to our employees and get response back within hours. And that was a key factor for some of these locations with vaccines, um, because we could tell them, if you are in a situation where you have 100 extra doses and you need to use those because the shelf life, as we all know, is very limited, you let us know, we can send that communication out to that targeted group of folks based on our own prioritization and get a response and get them there right away. Um, so that system was in place that was very appealing to people because no one wants to have vaccines go to waste. So we were able to present that to these groups, and then we find ourselves getting opportunities, you know, every so often we get these opportunities in 200, 400, 600 allotments. So we were continuing to push that. We were continuing to push the um, opportunities for people to go through the, the regular channels that we talked about through the state, through the vaccine connector. And we're also continuing to work on our on-site clinics because at the end of this whole process, we realized what made the most sense was for us to control the vaccinations at our own facilities. So we had two sites that we were gonna use. And I say we were going to use because that's changed a little bit based on what's happened this week. And it's, um, I consider it good news. I, I don't know if the numbers support right now, they don't look like they support the need for an onsite clinic because 
uh, we had an opportunity of 400, approximately 400 vaccines through the state, one of the state sites earlier in the week. We, we had a small vaccine planning group that comes together on a regular basis. We talked on Monday morning about how to best roll that out. And we used that communication system that I referenced. And we're to a point now where we have sent that out to, we know those employees that have been vaccinated have been taken out of that group. The remaining employee list, we've sent this employees of the council. And we said, are you interested in receiving a link for a vaccination? Yes or no, respond. And I can say that that went out to all of employees. We used all the allotted slots, the approximately 400 that we had at the beginning of the week. We have just, you know, we're, we're down in the single digits of people that have responded since then that said they would like to get a vaccine, um, but have yet to do so. So we'll continue to try to work with the state to get certain uh, allotments through the state run sites. Um, but in terms of numbers, as it sits right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go forward with an onsite clinic because of the fact that most people that have wanted to receive a vaccine, the council employees have either already received it, which is great, or they're going to be receiving it through our opportunity that came up this week. So the current status, again, uh, we had to pivot a little bit uh, this, this week, and, but we did a really good job with that. The communication, the system was built in into the into our structure, the, the system to communicate quickly. And we put that into place and we got a response. And um, there were a handful of people that had not responded, so we don't know. So we'll continue to focus on those and maybe give another effort to, to see if they have uh, a desire to get a vaccination um, while we continue to try to secure slots from uh, the state as well. Um, so with that good news, uh, we'll go to the next slide that talks a little bit more looking ahead in the longer term. Um, to the previous question about returning teleworkers to the office, what we are looking at is looking at a phased in approach and that we want to follow what guidelines are coming from the state, um, what we're seeing in terms of social distancing and, and mask wearing and whatever that needs to be in place. We want to have some guidance that we have council wide for a transition for employees to come back into the office that are currently teleworking. Um, and we're going to start to to those situations where it makes sense. And what I mean by that, when I, if it makes sense for the employee, they want to come back to the office. Um, it works for the employer and the manager and that work group. And a lot goes into that depending on the, the, the spacing and the logistics and, and the work environment. Um, but where it makes sense to do that, we will look to turn that dial slowly this summer. Um, and then right now we are following the state's guidelines where we are looking to have uh, continue to push that dial until September of this year, where we will look at a new approach um, based on what we see with the pandemic and the numbers. Um, again, it changes just about daily. So where we go today could be different um, in a month's time. And that was certainly the case with the, the on-site clinics with vaccinations. We put a lot of hours into trying to come up with this. And as it turns out, we don't need it, but that's that's a good thing. Um, the next two bullet points, the contact tracing and the testing, you know, we're not out of the woods yet with this. We still need to have a process in place that we can look to to get that word out if we have someone that is positive or is exposed that, that may need to quarantine. And we need, still need to have a testing uh, system in place. Um, we, we Again, the objective is to manage the spread of the, of the COVID uh, throughout the organization. So whatever we can have in place to quickly identify where those hotspots may be or where we may have a positive and to quarantine quickly, that's what we need to continue to focus on. We continue to have the, the lessons learned. There's a, a log that we're keeping of the lessons learned going forward with this, and we want to incorporate those into the con continued training exercises that we'll see at the, on the other side of the pandemic. Um, you know, a lot of great work has been done on this. I, I sit here and I'm just amazed that I'm amazed at everything that has been done behind the scenes that not everyone gets a chance to see. And, and when I talk about the lessons learned, one of the things that I've talked with Kathy and Lisa about is with the NIM structure, they have the planning group. Um, but what we have found with this pandemic plan is that there are so many plans and objectives that need to be met that take a lot of time. When you talk about vaccinations, you talk about uh, returning teleworkers to the office, it takes a tremendous amount of time. 
And it also takes a tremendous amount of effort to make sure that we are incorporating the needs and the business objectives of each division, because we want to do this in a thoughtful way so that it makes sense from an operational standpoint. So the lesson learned is maybe taking a look at how that planning group is structured in NIMS and modifying that for the council so that we have more specific, you know, maybe a, a, a lead uh, plan in the planning group, but then also specifics for the divisions. Um, and then a way to share some of these responsibilities, because I give a lot of credit to Matt Latour as kind of leading that group, and he's done a tremendous amount of work on this and just a great job uh, of pulling of this together to putting us in the position where we are today, which is really, I, I, I'm amazed at where we're at compared to other organizations and just anecdotally talking with colleagues. Um, we're in a really, really good spot, in my opinion. But we'll continue to focus as we move forward on, on some of the things I've talked about. Um, because we don't know where this is going to go. So with that, Mr. Chair and committee members, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, Are there any uh, questions from the committee members? Just a, a question. Are we incentivizing employees at all to get vaccines that so far, I've chosen not to get vaccines, or have we thought about that, or are we encouraging vaccinations? Yeah, Mr. Chair, we have, we did talk about that. Um, we continue with the messaging of we strongly encourage it. We're encouraging employees to go out and get the vaccine. Uh, we're offering them as many opportunities as uh, as we can. We're trying to make this as easy as possible. But in terms of other incentivizing, there isn't anything that we would be doing. Uh, specifically to incentivize them other than just to deliver that message of how critical that is and, and to make it as easy as possible for them. And then when we start looking at going back to work, back to Councilmember Barber's question, will we be giving people the option to come back to work or we will be deciding, the council will be deciding for people who's coming back to the office and who's not coming back? Mr. Chair, the initial phase in for this return to work will be something that would have to make, when I said make sense for the employee and the manager, it would be um, an option of the employee. And, th and that initial phase in would be sometime in the summer, we're talking about June, maybe July timeframe, depending on how the, how, how, um, the, how the, the pandemic is with the numbers until September. And then we'll reevaluate again as we get closer to September. We did reach out at one point to employees to get a sense as to what they might want. Uh, granted, this was quite a while ago and things have changed, but we did reach out to see, is there a desire to come back to work? And there, we had a variety of responses to that. So as the vaccines continue, to, to, uh, as more and more people continue to get vaccinated, as hopefully the numbers will start to go down, um, We'll start to phase that in, but initially it'll be a, an option where it makes sense for both the employee, but it also has to make sense for that manager and that work group. Thank you. Any any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you, Phil, and your team for all the great work you've done. And if there's anything else you need from us, please let us know. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Does somebody have a motion? Council member. Barber or Lilligren. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to make the motion. I don't have it. Okay. I'm having a hard time opening. Robert, it's attached to our meeting notice. If you can open it.
Councilmember Lilligren, I just resent it to you. I'm looking for it. Oh. Perhaps I can share it and we yeah, can Laura, read that Laura, way. Can you share, can you share yeah, it on the screen? Maybe. I'm yeah, I'm I'm not seeing it in my inbox. Sure. Okay. Or on the meeting list. Oh, no, I just got it. Did you get it? Yep. Okay. Well. So, Mr. Chair, I move to close this meeting under Section 13D.03, Subdivision 1 of the Minnesota Statute, so we consider a labor development negotiations related to labor strategy. And I'll second by Barbara. All right. Is there